In the morning of April 20th, 1999, television and radio audiences around the world were met with media reports of a shooting at a Colorado high school named Columbine. Authorities fronted by the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office soon told us that the school, located in unincorporated Jefferson County, had come under an attack involving a variety of guns, improvised explosive devices, and knives, claiming 15 lives between 11.20 and 12.08. In the hours following the school's evacuation, the Western corporate media ran interviews with students and teachers who had witnessed the attack, in which reporters probed them for emotional reactions. Many of these witnesses reported attackers not matching the descriptions of Eric Harris or Dylan Klebold, two Columbine seniors announced as the sole planners and perpetrators of the attack. The reports also mentioned attackers appearing in groups of three or more, and in places where Harris and Klebold never were. Independent journalists picked up on these and other incongruities in the information coming out of the Littleton area and posted them on the websites of 1999. The Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, amid pressure over the long delay in publishing their investigation's findings, released a report in May 2000, including over 11,000 pages of lead sheets, ballistics and eyewitness reports, and other attack-related media. The length of these reports did not lend them to rapid digestion, and the 9-11 attacks and overall shift in the American political climate of 2001 obscured many of the pressing domestic troubles facing America. Perhaps the dust of the Twin Towers has settled enough by now for the people of the world to take a fresh look at the attack launched on Columbine. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another special interview episode from MediaMonarchy.com. My name is James Evan Pilato. I'm your host and webmaster of the site and show. And coming to you early on Sunday morning, April 26th, 2009, my guest today is Evan Long on the line with us from Vermont. And we're here to talk about his production known as the Columbine Cause. So, Evan, let me say thanks very much for joining me. Well, thanks for the coverage. Absolutely. So I saw for the first time the Columbine Cause just a week or so ago on, of course, the 420 anniversary, and it really hit me hard. I think it's a really effective presentation, and it's fairly simple. It's not a high, flashy production. There's not scary music and a lot of crazy editing. It's essentially a slideshow with a voiceover, and I think you would agree, and I don't think I'm, I'm denigrating it in any way. I think what's so effective and how I explained it to some other people is that it's literally just the facts. When you cite something, you give a link on the documentation page. When you play a clip, you give a link to that. So if you can maybe just go over first a little bio and background, and then maybe second, what brought you to make the Columbine calls? Yeah, I think I think that's, that's an accurate description, and that was very much what I was consciously trying to do was to, there's a massive amount of information to pick out the best parts and to deliver it as effectively and rapidly as as possible so so uh you know uh putting the emphasis on that rather than say um you know flashy production value but i've been a writer for many years a uh, long time and essentially how i came to do this project was um following 9 11 i made a very concerted effort to try to figure out what was going on in the world because there were a lot of things about that when the news agencies switched to the 24-hour coverage and the Patriot Act was rolled out and Afghanistan these things struck me as as um, it just it seemed like there was something really off and and uh, I didn't know that much at the time but but it seemed like there was a lot more to the story of what was going on so so I made an effort to try to figure out as best I could what exactly was going on in the world. So uh, a couple years later, I saw the collapse of Building 7 up close and um, decided through that and some other things that that was likely a scam. Um, a couple years after that, I came across Columbine uh, evidence of additional uh, suspects in particular. Uh, coming out of the government documents and decided to get involved with that because no one was really covering it in a really concerted way as had been done with 9-11. And 
I'm probably in a similar boat, as probably a lot of a lot of folks that are probably around our same age. I'm 31, and I had always been, you know, somewhat politically aware, but I, you know, more or less came of age in the fantastic 90s, where I thought everything was great, the music was awesome, there were cool indie movies, there was this thing, the internet, and I was just starting college in the mid-90s, and everything was great. So, post-9-11, you know, I was in my college town, and I was doing radio and theater work, and doing sound design and stuff, and I was kind of the media guy, but on my own, behind the scenes, I started to do my own sort of investigation and research into 9-11. And it was something, you know, in 2002, 2003, I kind of kept to myself because there weren't a whole lot of people talking about it, and I don't know if we even had the term 9-11 truth. Columbine and the school shooters and, and these other kind of similar events didn't really start to hit me until I get possibly the Virginia Tech situation. And at least in that case... If I didn't think there were suspicious questions, you can at least look at them and say, well, they're on the psychotropic drugs. They're almost always on the psychotropic drugs. They've recently come from some strange psychological setting. And they, of course, love to play the first person shooter games. So is that a a similar kind of situation? Yeah, post post 9-11, you started to look around and say, hmm, things aren't really what they seem and and that's generally what i tell people you know in speaking about 9-11 i don't know exactly what happened all i know is what they say is the official story can't be true yeah well that kind of changed uh everything um i came across a couple of videos which to me presented a very solid argument that that these were basically this was a huge scam on the public Um, particularly, I mean, Building 7, that's always where I start because a lot of people don't even know that 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 building even came down. But but basically, I came across that, and um, it changed everything. I I found myself trying to rethink, um, you know, a a lot of what I had assumed, I guess, which, and I guess I hadn't spent a huge amount of uh, thought on it prior to that, but it seemed like a kind of pressing situation where, you know, the country's being drained financially and emotionally and, you know, just about every other way by this, uh, by the wars that we had been called into. So, um, and, and, and it followed from there that, well, so the bombing type terrorism has been exposed as um, fake, uh, you know, real enough in terms of damage, but fake as far as the, uh, the story and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a theatrical production. Um, you know that well since the bombing type terrorism was fake you know what about these these mass shootings columbine uh is one and and this is not to say everyone but um most probably the more high profile ones which would include columbine um there was one dunblane in the uk port arthur in australia um also the gladio attacks which some of your audience might be more familiar with than uh, Dunblane or Port Arthur, the Gladio attacks in Europe, which was shown to be, as I have it, uh, NATO intelligence. Um, so again, the intelligence service, services performing these terrorist acts, um, that, that involved, in, in addition to assassinations, mass shooting uh, type scenarios. So, um, you know, could we be looking at the same, same type of thing in Columbine? And uh, I think that that's probable or, or, or at least possible I, I would say I would say a- absolutely absolute. that not every event is a staged event by any stretch and and that's I, I worry sometimes that you know when we're swimming in these waters that are oh everything's a big conspiracy no it is the bigger high profile events that seem to get things done on the sort of social scene and the congressional scene that seem to have a lot of the uh, the questions behind them so yes there are real disturbed kids who kill their parents or go and shoot people at school yes there are terrorists who blow themselves up on buses but when it's a massive and like you said you know 24/7 mainstream media news blitz we start to wonder what else is perhaps going on. So I know that I've said for the last year, well before the election, 
last year that, you know, if and when the Democrats came back in, I believe we would see a shift back towards the homegrown terror type enemy that we would shift back to what we saw during the 90s of homegrown terrorism and McVeigh's and Waco's and crazy people who think that martial law is coming. And we've seen that, I mean, already here, and we're not even through the big vaunted 100 days. We've already seen the sort of apparatus kind of wheeled around and, and turned right back towards people who want to see more of the Constitution. So let's actually get into, without getting too heavy into some of the specific you know, names and, and places and things that folks may not know without watching the Columbine calls... For me, one of the biggest things that really struck me, and I'd like to use to speak on this, is that in the testimonies, any time a witness mentions someone else other than Dylan or Eric by name, that name is always redacted in the reports. Yeah, well, to, to refresh people's memories, it's been 10 years. Um, Columbine was probably... The, the most high profile terror act, even though it wasn't really referred to as with the terrorism label, it was essentially covered in the same style as 9-11 with the saturation media coverage. Um, but but it's, it's been a long time. So, so just to refresh people's memories, the official story on this is that uh, uh, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold uh, went into their school at about 11.15 in the morning um, shot and killed 13 people, including themselves. They killed themselves by a couple of minutes after 12. And uh, no one else had any foreknowledge. No one else helped them. Uh, no one else knew anything about it. They were a, a pair of lone nuts working in, uh, in conjunction. Um, there was about a year-long investigation afterward. And uh, even though there was a sizable trench coat uh, group who many of their peers said that they were involved with, Officially, none of them had anything to do with it, and everyone was written out of the story. So, some people are familiar with the official version, which is, uh, I guess, uh, immortalized in the sheriff's office final report on the Columbine High School shootings. That was released on May 15th, 2000. And uh, that's where you can find, um, you know, basically the official story, the official timeline, all that kind of stuff. After that, there were people who were not satisfied with that version of events. And so they pressed law enforcement to release their internal documents and their internal files, basically Freedom, freedom of Information Act type of, of requests. So from that point to today... There have been about 30,000 pages of documents released, plus uh, 911 audio recordings and things like that. Um, and that's where you really get the real story. And as you said, there are, um, to, to sum it up in a sentence, many dozens of corroborating witnesses flooded the police with reports of additional shooters, describing them in detail or naming them by name. For one reason or another, the uh, police came back and said, nope, they had nothing to do with it. Um, I think that that's unlikely. But as you said, their names were mostly redacted out of the documents, um, except for here and there, you can see their names poking through. And by kind of uh, collating some of that information, you can get a different story of what the witnesses said happened. So some of the folks... That are mentioned go by the name. I, the, one of the names I know that I caught was Chris Morris. And again, just looking at some of the photos and listening to some of the reports, you have people, and again, with photo documentation, that there are people up on the roof of the school at the same time, you know, that the, the rampage was, was going on. You have three guys being arrested who were, of course, later let go. And again, even, even as I mentioned it, it, it smacks of some of the same situations as something like 9-11, where early on you get the conflicting kind of reports, and as the hours go by, the official story starts to solidify, and some of these other names and some of these other discrepancies all start to disappear. So, you know, over 100 bombs 
and pipe bombs and other things were found in the school. Did these two guys load all these things in the school? Seems highly doubtful. And it's also mentioned that a lot of the students knew that something had been in the works for quite some time. This was, of course, also known as, I believe, Senior Prank Day. So people thought, you know, something, you know, it was a, it was a hoax. The other bit is the video that was made two years before the massacre. If you can speak to that. Yeah, there were there were a number of video projects. Some some people might be familiar with some of the ones which had been released. There were some released which were made by Harrison Klebold in their video class. These would include, I believe YouTube removed a bunch of these recently. I'm not exactly sure why, but you can probably find them on some of the other um, many competitors to YouTube uh, out there. Um, those would include Hitmen for Hire, um, some of their other, I mean, that, that's, that's a pretty, that one encapsulates the whole them in, uh, excuse me, them in trench coats, uh, shooting people at the school. There were also a number of video projects which were not released. Um, there, there are actually some questions. If you go through the documents, their video teacher was extremely, well, they, they had a couple of video teachers, according to the, the, to the peers, one of, at least one of which um, referred to as a Gwylam, or some strange spelling of a name. Um, he was never interviewed. Um, and, and then I guess their main video teacher, uh, if I have it correctly, um, got a lawyer and, and was, was not providing that much information to police. But so a, a lot of these video projects made not just by Harrison Klebold, who are probably only a small part of the story, but by the rest of the trench coat group, um, were, were ne never really made public. The one you're talking about, um, there was collaboration on that video with uh, between the trench coat group and then um, a guy named Scott Fusilier, who graduated in '97. Um, and he was also the son of the FBI uh, supervisor of the Columbine case um, named uh, Dwayne Fusilier. So uh, there, if I could interrupt you for just, sure. just a second, there's a clip of, and I believe it's recently, because now, of course, as we have the anniversary, everyone's, everyone's got a book to sell and all their sort of retrospective pieces on why this happened and, of course, never getting it, a lot of the root, real root causes. But yeah, and, and I, I would just interject, not that they don't have the information, they're just choosing not to include it. Absolutely. So recently we had, is it Dwayne? Was the is the lead FBI investigator, yeah. Dwayne yeah. Fusilier, and that's F U S E L I E R. Yeah, was recently on Oprah, and they're talking about this. And of course, I don't believe they mentioned in that clip that his son Scott worked on a video with Dylan and Eric. And was this the one I believe? You know, showing them hitmen for hire, showing them as actually protecting those weaker among us from the jocks yeah that was the story and that was how the trench coat group tended to view themselves and portray themselves as these these kind of uh you know well if you know if you want to go back to the crow or something like that um one of the early i guess trench coat movies um you know, as these kind of like wronged, uh, you know, people setting things right by any means necessary, including being exceedingly violent. Um, that that tends to be, if you read the interviews of, of the trench coders, they tend to portray themselves as having been extremely bullied and that they got together to basically kind of fight back and be intimidating as a group and, and, um, and, and that kind of thing. And you see that exactly in, in the Hitman for Hire video. A lot of their peers did not share that view, that they said that they, there was a belligerent group who was very intimidating and people thought were kind of uh, volatile and unstable. Um, but the, uh, yeah, that, that Oprah clip, I have not seen that clip, but that was, I guess, from the show that Oprah filmed for the anniversary, but um, which got pulled. She decided not to air it for some reason. I don't exactly know why. Someone made the comment that, uh, well, you know, maybe somebody got to her because they were going to be, you know, leaking some a truth. I really doubt it because this was, uh, as you were saying, Dwayne Fusilier alongside Dave Cullen, 
who wrote the book, which if any books are probably going to be selling on this, it's his, um, Columbine. Uh, he was a writer for Salon. Um, I mean, he, he, it's like I said, it's not that they don't have the information. They just don't cover it. And, and yeah, definitely, uh, this video with Dwayne Fusilier's son, well, Fusilier's quote on that was something like investor, uh, journalist tried to reach him on the phone to ask him, Hey, you know, we, we heard that your son went to Columbine and he made videos with the trench coders involving people running around the school in trench coats with guns. Um, and he says something like, uh, you know, no, stop right there. You got nothing there. And then his mother says, uh, Scott and the boys who made that video don't want to talk about it. Well, you know, great. But I mean, it seems possibly relevant. Then again, what do I know? <laughs> well, when you mentioned the, the crow and I, you know, I'm always interested in any kind of media meme connection. There's, of course, also the basketball diaries where in the film with Leonardo DiCaprio, and it's based on the Jim Carroll book. He has this fantasy sequence where he falls asleep in class and busts into the classroom in a long black trench coat and blasts everyone away. I believe it was written by Lauren Coleman, who's the author of a book called The Copycat Effect. He also runs a blog at copycateffect.blogspot.com. He noted that Oprah canceled her anniversary show and he doesn't cite this source, but he says she canceled it because it seemed too... It, it, it made them into celebrities, and it was just all too much. He actually congratulated her for not running the show. His take on a lot of this isn't from a sort of, you know, conspiratorial or Manchurian candidate type end. His is that it's media-infused copycats. So he applauded Oprah for not running this show. If I heard a clip, so if it was from this show that didn't run, then I'm not sure if, if that's where I heard the clip from. Recently, James Corbett on CorbettReport.com on episode 84, April is the cruelest month, he played this clip of Oprah talking to Facilier. And she even referred to, you know, some of these tapes and all these recordings that they have as the basement tapes. And even that right there reminds me if there's a, a media connection, aren't the basement tapes what Bob Dylan and, you know, members of the band recorded when they were kind of squirreled away? So it has this, you know, it's it's this weird media mashup. Yeah, well, two, two points on that. Um, I could see why the recording with Cullen and Fusilier would turn out to be uh, basically a nonstop discussion of Harrison Klebold because... Their job, I mean, I would guess, their job is basically um, to cast so much light on these two patsies, or the fall guys. I mean, they seem as they were involved. But, I mean, these, these fall guys, to cast so much light on them and to enshrine them in such a way that no one even thinks to look beyond that, or that no one's even able to look beyond that because everything relating to Columbine only discusses them. And, and with such a such a degree of uh, you know extreme focus that you just figure well you know if there was something else to it this guy would have mentioned it um, so I could see how I mean their past coverage uh, Colin and Fusilier because they've worked together before which tells you something about perhaps the trustworthiness of Colin as a journalist that he's working um, so closely with uh, with the official you know, uh, kind of handler of the, of the Columbine story, uh, and promoting his views. Um, so, so I, I could see it on that as far as, um, as you know, we discussed earlier that sometimes these things are spontaneous. There are, you know, you were saying, you know, there are kids who just lose it. They're, they're depressed. They snap and, you know, and people do have always, I mean, you know, people have committed suicide throughout history and sometimes they take people with them. Um, however, in uh, differentiating between what you're talking about with the copycat effect, um, I'm somewhat familiar with that um, theory, basically. I think that you may have uh, possibly some events which are um, manipulated, which are, which are specially arranged to act as triggers. In other words, uh, a, a planted large event, which will then act as a copycat. 
um, but but that the act itself is not spontaneously arising, and then and then other people spontaneously copy it. So, and I would think that from this, from looking at Columbine and from studying the documents, which give you really a different story than you you can hear in any uh, mainstream source. I'm not the only person who's covered the documents. There are a couple others, but. Um, you know, no one really in the mainstream. For example, if you do an internet search on Chris Morris Columbine, you won't turn up anything in relation to him being a suspect based on the argument that someone had spotted him and reported him at school with a gun that day. They'll say, oh, he was a friend with the killers. Police thought he might have been involved, but they won't say that anybody reported him. If you do a search on Robert Perry Columbine, who was named by, probably named or described by about two dozen people. He had severe acne, among other things. Um, you'll get no hits except for me and a couple other people, nobody in the mainstream. So so that, that's what I would basically say is that, um, you know, as far as, far as the, uh, the copycat effect and, and things like that, um, it's, it's probably not so much a case of, of just the, the spontaneous um, you know, uh, the, the, this having been a spontaneous uh, shooting. As far as the basement tapes, they're one of the few pieces of evidence which have not been released. Um, we have to wonder why, because they've released pretty much everything else. Um, they've even released some transcripts of the basement tapes. This is Harrison Klebold sitting in their basement talking about what they're going to do. Um, one theory is that they made a lot of other videos basically pretending to be school shooting uh, you know, to, to be planning for a school shooting, where these basement tapes may be not the actual confessions that they're made out to be. Um, it, it's one theory. Well, and again, it it reminds me of all the other footage of things we've we've never seen. I am sometimes hopeful in in thinking about you know the nine eleven investigation that you know we're we're not eight years away that hopefully we perhaps haven't seen some of the most interesting video footage I compare it to in the in the timeline of things after JFK the public did not see the Zapruder film until of all people Geraldo Rivera showed it on his television show Goodnight America in 1975 and that was right around that turning point of, you know, not only then the church committee hearings and things right around the corner. Once the public saw the Zapruder film, they all had huge doubts. My hope is that we've not seen our Zapruder film of 9-11 and that perhaps we, we will. Some of the other researchers and things I know you cite in the notes, and again, that's one of the th one of the main things you know that I that I commend you on on this project is that it's all sourced, it's all documented, and again, you don't need flashy production when you just have the facts, and many of them are pretty much irrefutable. If the ones that aren't are pretty much big, huge questions that get lodged in your brain, I know you cite uh, Visigoth as someone, and I know when I listen to him, he would he would mention the Port Arthur case. And it's, again, these big events that get things happening. And it's what, you know, folks refer to as problem, reaction, solution. They cause the problem to generate the reaction out of us so that they can offer their pre-made, already written solution. So whether that is the Patriot Act or more gun laws, or even in the case of post-Oklahoma City, Bill Clinton wanted to pass the big omnibus crime bill. And again, sure they have all these things set up, but they just need that, you know, quote unquote, helpful wave of indignation. Sure. Yeah, that was a little mini 9-11 with, uh, you know, something blowing up and then a mini Patriot Act passed. And that's one that, you know, we can't get into some of the super specifics because folks probably won't be able to follow along. But I implore you guys out there to go check out the Columbine cause. And even, you know, I, I watched it on the computer first and then I basically threw it on my iPod and just listened to the audio. And I did actually see you have a, a link of just the audio for someone if you can throw it on your iPod and, and listen to it. Yeah, actually, I condensed that one down a little bit so it'll fit on a CD, too, because the, the video is 88 minutes. It's a full, you know, feature length. 
uh, video, but I, I cut about eight minutes out so that if you want to fit it onto just an audio CD, um, you know, you can do that too. Well, and there are, and, and I'm sure a lot of those cuts were probably just some of the pauses where you're just showing documentation and photos. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's about four minutes of silence I took out, and then there was four minutes of just... I guess, you know, the, the least uh, the least important, you know, audio, we'll say. So as we go basically from the past, and again, you know, this has been now 10 years ago, and as, again, you point out in, in the film that it was right before 9-11, and as these reports were coming out, was right before 9-11. So once 9-11 happened, everything kind of shifted, and, yeah, we weren't really thinking about Columbine until the shootings started to happen again and of course you know we had kip kinkle here in oregon and we had you know the port arthur case and dunblane and virginia tech and some of the other names that that escape me but as i started to track several weeks ago as we were heading into what i figured would be you know the, for whatever reason the prime time for these mass shooter and copycat events for the last several weeks it's been outrageous and even last night just glancing at the news quickly see that you know there's a professor who's now wanted who shot several people i believe at a georgia school you have a situation in florida where two police officers were killed just a couple of weeks ago you of course had the immigration center shooting in new york and then you had the pittsburgh shooting and in that situation the shooter did not die which is generally the case generally these guys don't don't make it out alive but in the case of richard poplowski he's around and it seems as though he's around because he is being used for this sort of homegrown terrorism demonization so after that pittsburgh shooting we see Richard Poplowski, you know, was a fan of online conspiracy theories. So can you speak to perhaps the, the way we see this shifting around and the way that we even see legislation now turning towards, you know, homegrown terrorism? Yeah, well, that's even the case. Um, I mean, they certainly did that with Timothy McVeigh. They really milked that for everything it was worth. Um, although there's real questions about who he was, you know, whether he was really acting independently or, you know, who he was maybe even working for, um, not just with. But they even did that really in the case of Harris, Eric Harris, too. Um, if you read a lot of what's, uh, you know, written about him, he talks about allegedly in his in his diaries and, and things like that um, is is uh, talking about, you know, the can't trust the government and there's and there's conspiracies and uh, uh, which is is even leading I saw in one online discussion about um, school shootings someone having the theory that um, the that these kind of mass shooters are likely to be people who have a very libertarian view of uh, taking matters into their own hands and uh, you know kind of being um, you know, uh, meeting out justice, you know, through a gun kind of things. And that I, I, could, I that's, I mean, that's a thought that that has crossed my mind. Um, kind of, uh, um, you know, I mean, you have these shootings, you, you, you provoke a lot of rage. <clears throat> However, you're going to portray the villain in that situation is going to p potentially have some political, uh, clout, um, you know, so it's it's really just a matter of you know saying here's the enemy, here's here's what he's interested in, and you know that can certainly have a lot of sway in the public's mind. Well, as we start to wrap it up here, I, I guess I just wonder what you what you perhaps see coming down the road here in the not too distant future. We of course you know have have our big, you know, change agent in the White House. However, things don't really seem to be changing. Yeah, well, we're currently experiencing this, uh, <clears throat> the effects of the bailout and, um, you know, the, the economic situation, uh, which people have been, as I, you know, have discovered, people have been discussing on the Internet since at least the, the mid-90s that, something was, you know, um, catastrophic was going to happen with, with regard to the economy, that it was 
you know, sort of being primed for this. I mean, that seems to be the major thing on the horizon. As far as probably your audience is, you know, I'm sure aware of um, very skeptical of 9-11 to say the least. It seems to me like that perhaps has been, as I mentioned, so thoroughly um, called into question. You know, I don't know, maybe, uh, if, if they'll be able to pull off anything like that again, and it might just be this steady stream of every couple of months there's going to be some, you know, mall shooter or school shooter or, or something, which seems to be the case. There's so many of these now. Um, and that putting more of a focus on that uh, might be helpful as far as bringing an end to it um, for... for, uh, for you know, uh, if people are looking for places to direct their efforts, that might be something because to pull off a 9-11 obviously takes a lot of manpower and, um, uh, you know, it's a very, uh, I guess you could say risky type type of thing. Um, a shooting, you know, you got one person in there, so probably is a little more convenient for uh, if these are run by, uh, you know, police services, probably are, are a little more convenient and handy to do so so i'd say uh yeah as you said all the documentation is on the website i put up all the documents that i cited it tells a remarkably different story than you would uh uh get from any you know any well pretty much any other video right now or, or any uh news story and um, i think people will be pretty surprised because i was i was shocked and stunned and the more thought I give it, uh, just the more more incredible it seems to be at this point. But but uh, signs do point to Columbine having been yet another massive cover up. I think you're absolutely right, unfortunately. And again, let me let me thank you for taking the time to talk to me. If there's anything that you want to leave folks with, as far as maybe the the way to get the documentary perhaps the way to help you out or to get in contact with you or any other just words of wisdom you want to leave us yeah well people can uh if you're looking for it you can just type in columbine cause into any search engine and it'll come up in the first you know if, if not the first result one of the first um there's also a shortcut to the site the columbine cause tk and that'll get you there. And I pretty much put everything just right onto one page so that you can find it. There's a transcript up there. There is, if you're looking for the documents, it's under notes um, where I give citations and I link to PDFs on my website. There you'll find uh, some related articles and, and that kind of thing. If you uh, are looking for it on DVD, it's there too. If you're looking for video files, I've got it right on the site. Um, aside from that, I'd just like to thank the people. I mean, I was not the first person to pick up on this. I was just kind of, you know, running with it. Um, uh, as, as you said, I, I thank some people at the end of the video. Um, one of them would be Rolf Zeichmar, who's posted under Star Viego, uh, active at the Echoes of Columbine website. Uh, that's a message forum. It's signofthetimes.yuku.com. Um, and there's a lot of threads. It's that's a message board devoted to Columbine, and if you uh, look around on there, there's there's a lot of good uh, discussion threads there. All right, man. Well, I I thank you very much, and perhaps we'll we'll talk again in the future. So, Evan Long, the creator of the Columbine Calls, thanks for coming on Media Monarchy. Yeah, thanks a lot. For all of the psychobabble the public was subjected to from this or that psychological expert, Harris, a psychiatrist who had been writing him prescriptions for various psychoactive chemicals, including Zoloft and Luvox, was never put before a microphone. Doctor-patient confidentiality protects the contents of therapy sessions, but is precluded by admissions of plans to commit crimes, and precedent does exist for action to be taken against psychiatrists who knowingly allow their patients to continue despite such confessions. In 1983, for example, Dr. John Hopper was sued to the tune of $14 million by then-Secretary of State Jim Brady and Secret Service agents for having made the mental condition of the son of Bush family business colleague John Hinckley, John Hinckley Jr., worse 
and failing to heed signals by his patient that he might try a political assassination. According to drug fact sheets and a lawsuit filed by attack survivor Mark Taylor, some of the Luvox's possible side effects are quite adverse, including homicidal and suicidal behavior, along with emotional blunting or a deadening of empathy. During the time that he was ingesting the substance, Harris, who was known to occasionally drink alcohol and smoke marijuana, was even accused by his father of being under the influence of LSD. According to unsourced reports by researcher Brian Desborough, at the age of 10, Harris allegedly used to complain to his friends that he was being drugged at the Plattsburgh Air Force Base where his father worked until its official closure in September 1995. 